Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Monarch butterflies attract attention. Today, we're going to be talking about these small garden visitors. Also, we will be planting blueberries. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mary Smith. Mary is the Backyard Wildlife Curator at Litterman Nature Center, and Mr. D will be joining me later. All right, Mary, it's always good to have you here. It's great to be back. All right, so let's talk about monarch biology. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. This is yeah. going to be interesting. So monarch butterflies, Danaeus plexippus, is uh -huh. the scientific name, okay. um, but a really interesting insect that we have learned a lot about just in recent um, history. So um, what's really interesting about the monarchs is they are long distance migrators. And okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about their migration, but we didn't really figure out where they were going in their migration until the late 70s. So it's rather a new um, phenomenon that we learned about relatively um, recently in history. Okay. So um, let's say January, February, winter time. Okay down in the central Mexico transvolcanic mountains, there is one type of fir tree, an oyamel fir tree, that the monarchs are spending their winter on. Late January, February, it starts to warm up a little bit, and all of these monarchs take off from this uh, transvolcanic mountains, and they're headed back to the United States. Wow. So their migration gets really interesting. So I think the best way to explain it is by following one butterfly and then her offspring. Okay. So we have this butterfly that has spent her winter down in central Mexico. Um, February, early March, she reaches the Texas coast, the Gulf Coast. She finds milkweed, which is the only plant they're gonna be laying eggs on, and she lays her eggs and then she dies, wow. okay? So then we have her daughter is one of those eggs. Okay. She hatches, she actually migrates a little bit further north. She lays her eggs, she feeds, um, and she ends up dying about four weeks later, okay? So now the granddaughter, we're following the granddaughter. Okay. She also is going to um, feed on nectar sources, migrate a little bit further north, find a mate, lay her eggs. She dies after wow. about four weeks. Now we're at the great granddaughter, and she probably is somewhere up in Pennsylvania or maybe even further north around the Canadian border where the limit of milkweed is. Okay. Okay. And this is when it gets really interesting. All right. Instead of her migrating further north, she's actually going to start migrating south. She's not going to find a mate and lay eggs. She's actually going to live somewhere between like six and eight months she's migrating all the way back to where that original butterfly was in the transvolcanic mountains. Wow, how about that? So it's only this, what we call super generation, <laughs> fourth or fifth generation of the, that original butterfly that is my, making that 2,000 to 3,000 mile journey back to central Mexico. This uh, multi-generational uh, migration. Right. Yeah. So they don't spend any time in the United States in the summer? Well. In the sun, so usually starting about August through late October is when they're migrating south. Okay. Now there are a few populations that are overwintering in Florida. And I should mention that when I'm talking about this long distance migration, it is just the Eastern population of monarchs. So just east of the Rockies. Okay, got it. In the Western United States, there are monarchs. They don't do a long distance migration. They migrate down to Southern California. Oh, okay. So two distinct the, populations. Gotcha. What we're mainly talking about is the Eastern population, the one that does this long distance migration. Long distance. Yes. Without a car. Right. How yeah. about that? So, yeah, it's, how about that? that? That's amazing to me. Okay. Yeah, but that's it's amazing. funny that you mention a car because one of the things I tell people they can, you know, if we were driving to Mexico, yeah. we would have to stop along the way, <laughs> yeah. refuel yeah. our car, right. eat food eat, ourselves. Right, right. That's what monarchs have to do too, but instead of gas stations, they're stopping at what we call way stations. 
good. This is one of the main ways that people can help monarchs on their migration. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's putting in the fuel for the monarchs. And mainly that's going to be nectar sources. Got it. Okay. Okay. So what we want to be planting is we want to be planting the spring blooming stuff for when they're first migrating north. Things like phlox mm -hmm. um, and blue star so, are early yeah. blooming ones when they're first passing through. Then on their fall migration, we want to be planting things like blazing stars and golden rods um, that they're going to be stopping at on their southern migration. Got it. So in order to understand their flight, though, their journey, they have to get tagged, right? Oh, right. So that, remember I said that was a recent discovery. We figured that out. And how we figured that out was by tagging butterflies okay. and finding those. So we would tag them in um, the United States. And then eventually they found some of those tagged butterflies at that overwintering site. So that's how we figured it out. Okay. That project is still ongoing. Wow. We still do it at the Nature Center. Okay. Um, we're tagging uh, southern migrating butterflies in the fall time. And we put a little sticker on them, and yeah. it's through a program called Monarch Watch. Mm -hmm. That tag has a unique number that identifies that individual butterfly. So we know things, if it's recovered, we know um, how long it took to get to wherever it was recovered, um, and the distances that they're traveling, things like that. So That's it's cool. a citizen science project, too. So you don't have to work at a nature center to do mm -hmm. it. Anybody can um, go to Monarch Watch and purchase tags and tag monarchs in their area. And we actually have a video of tagging monarchs. <laughs> I think somebody here might have done that video oh, for us. Maybe. All right, so can we talk a little bit more about the life cycle of the monarchs? Sure, so um, the life cycle is a complete life cycle. So mm -hmm. that means it goes egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, adult. Got it. And what the only host plant or the only plant that they're laying on is milkweed. Okay. The females can lay um, probably close to 400 eggs. Really? And they are typically looking to just lay one per leaf mm -hmm. per milkweed plant. That's not always the case now. And what we're encountering is we don't have enough milkweeds uh, to support all of that. Right. Um, so we're seeing multiple eggs on, on plants and on leaves. So one of the things we can do to help them when they first are arriving back is planting native milkweeds to your area. Okay. So there are a variety of milkweeds native across the United States. So look up what's native in your area mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and plant those so the monarchs have a place to lay their eggs. Yeah, that's good. So you have... So this is a milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, it's still early in the season, so our milkweeds <laughs> yeah. are just coming up. Um, but there's a variety of native milkweeds. Um, this one is called butterfly weed. <laughs> um, some of our favorites in this area are common milkweed. Okay. Um, we also have one that's called swamp milkweed yeah. that does really well. It seems to be a favorite of theirs. But all across the United States, I think there's around 70 different milkweeds. Wow, I didn't um, it that many. So yeah. wherever people are, they can find a milkweed that's right. native to that region. Good deal. So what about tropical milkweed? So tropical milkweed is a plant that is gain has gained some traction, especially here in the Mid-South. Sure. But we're encountering some issues. So tropical milkweed is not native to the southeast. Sure. What's happening is it's a great plant to have around. It blooms a long time into when the monarchs are migrating south. What's happening is monarchs are stopping and laying eggs instead of continuing their migration mm -hmm. south. Um, we think that the reason that super generation lives so long is because they're not laying eggs until they migrate back. Mm -hmm. So if they're encountering tropical milkweed, um, we think it's stimulating them to start laying instead of continuing to migrate. So my recommendation, natives of course, yeah, yeah. if you really want the tropical, um, cut the blooms back when the monarchs are migrating south or move that plant inside if you can. Uh, gotta ask you this, so the attraction for the monarchs, why are people interested in monarchs, you think? Yeah, so I think Part of it is they're um, big, colorful butterflies, mm. um, but I think it is a lot of their biology. At yeah. least they, I find that so interesting. Their migration, um, their uh, host specificity, so only going to milkweeds, um, and they're ones that we can attract to our gardens too.
So it looks like we need to help out the monarchs. Yes, the absolutely. We can, right? Yeah, and we, like I said, we all have a little bit of space yeah. or we can contribute time um, to citizen science projects to help the monarchs. That sounds good. Mary, that was great information. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, the Thanks. migration is just so interesting to it's me. It's so interesting. You were thinking they only weigh a couple paper clips. They're <laughs> making this long distance migration and, and how they know to travel down to that one region is still a mystery that scientists are working on. And see, that's what I wonder. How do they know to go there? I don't know. It's, you know, there, we know a Golly. few things about, you know, they use their antenna for orientation, but how do they know to go to that one region is still a mystery. Wow. Thank you much. You're we appreciate welcome. that, Mary. It's great information. The freeze of 2022 here in the Mid-South was devastating. We planted this rose bush about four years ago. Look what the freeze did to it, right? And the question that we get now is, how can you tell if my plant material is dead or not? Well, let's see. You just try to bend back some of these limbs here and they just break off like this. Chances are it's dead. And as you can see from this rose shrub here, it's pretty dead. Right? But if you look at the bottom of it, you see that it's growing back from the rootstock. That's your indicator, right? So that actually means that you can prune back all of this dead tissue here, all of these dead stems, and just let it come back. All right, Mr. D, we're out in the uh, family plot garden. Blueberries. Blueberries, one of my favorite crops. I like blueberries. They're easy to grow. They grow well in this area, provided you uh -huh. plant the right type. All right, okay. And uh, they have very little insect and disease pressure. Uh, uh, just really, really neat fruit to grow. Uh, What's the right type? Right type is a rabbit eye type. Rabbit eye. And unfortunately, if, if a lot of the stores sell high bush <laughs> types, right. which work well in higher elevation areas of Tennessee, like the Smoky Mountains. Right. <laughs> uh, but you need a rabbit eye type, and you have a list of those varieties I at do. the Extension Office. I sure do. What we have here, uh, blueberries require cross-pollination, right. so you okay. need at least two varieties. And uh, we have Tiff Blue and Climax mm -hmm. here. They're two of the more popular right. blueberry varieties in the southeast United States. They've, they're proven. They do well. That's what I've got at my house. Okay. And, uh, and uh, they, they, they really do well. Uh, time to plant blueberries is, you know, preferably when they're dormant, but November to March. Okay. And so we're barely squeezing right. in on the, right. on the late end of the planting season. Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant them in a, uh, I'm going to dig a hole pretty wide hole, not okay. much deeper than, you know, I want to make sure they're not planted any deeper than they're growing in the pot, but I'm going to add uh, sphagnum or Canadian peat moss to the planting hole. Uh, for a home garden, it says two gallons of Canadian or sphagnum peat moss to, and mix it in with the soil at the planting hole. Okay. If you're a commercial grower, it's two or three shovelfuls of ah. peat moss in the planting hole the bottom of it and then and then plant them and okay. we're going to do it the commercial way and when it says two or three three i mean three. <laughs> three. you yeah. can't get too much sphagnum peat right. moss in a planting hole and if you have planted blueberries without putting sphagnum peat moss uh -oh. and they're just kind of sitting there and they're not growing dig them up put it in there put peat moss in the ground right. and plant them on top of it because the the, the peat moss holds moisture mm -hmm. and it helps this young plant grow because it, 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 it increases the water holding okay. capacity. It also is, is uh, more acidifying. Mm -hmm. it, 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 uh, and, and blueberries, are uh, they, they do best in a very yeah. acid soil, 4.8 to 5.2. Yeah, which is low. I prefer 4.8. Right. So your blueberries kind of need to be off to themselves because they're pretty much the only plant in this garden landscape that needs an acid environment. Okay. Uh, azaleas and camellias, if you know, you can have your blueberries around your azaleas and camellias or azaleas and you'll be okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. But, but uh, you need to keep them away from our blackberries and our other, uh, other fruit trees, mm -hmm. figs, peaches, okay. almost all the others require a, a high pH, you know, 6, 6.2 yeah. or something like that is better. How about that? But, uh, in a commercial planting, five to six feet apart is what they recommend planting them in a row. Okay. Uh, with the rows being 10 to 12 feet apart. Mm. Uh, give yourself some room because this rabbit eye type blueberry, 
uh, <laughs> can get up to 20 feet tall if you let it. Wow. And uh, you can, can kind of control that with your pruning shears. Okay. Um, but give yourself some room. I know we've got, we're already marked out here and I think we have them 10 feet apart is what we have them here. And that way you'll be able, there'll be individual shrubs and you can walk completely around right. them and pick them and, and prune them and, and all that. And that would be the best way to do it if you have room. Don't okay. have room, plant them five or six feet apart and you'll have about a uh, eight or 10 foot shrub. Jeez. You know, long, it'll be long. You won't right. be able to go between them. They'll oh, eventually right. grow together and intertwine together. I think you'd be best going around them. Yeah, yeah I, you, I prefer, you if you have room, way. I prefer right, to do you that. Have room. So we've got our spot marked here and I guess right. I'm ready to, let me kind of, let me move this one a bit out of the way. Yeah, get that old Bermuda out of there, right? Yeah. One in. Mm, cut it up a little bit. Just go the sides. Yeah. Even though I don't think we got too much clay here. I want to make sure that the roots don't have any trouble penetrating. All right. Okay, I think that's uh, got it in pretty good shape, so I'm ready to add my sphagnum peat moss. The peat moss. Two or three good shovelfuls. That right. guy's a little dusty now. Oh, yeah. Which will help this wet soil we've got. That's one. All right. Two. Two. There you go. Three. We'll go with this tiff blue. Check the roots out. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, it doesn't look too root bound. Uh, I don't think there's bad. any need to do any scoring. Not too bad. I'm just gonna plant that just like it is. Okay. Let's see that. Look about the right depth. Uh, I want it the uh, you know mm -hmm. the same depth that it, it grew in the nursery. Okay. All right, Let's start adding the soil back. Now, do you like to pack it in as you go? Nah, okay. not really. I know I some mean, folks I mean, like to do that. What I what I need to do is water it in after we get it set. Mm -hmm. Going to have a have to fight the Bermuda grass. Oh, yeah. and, of course, post. Mm -hmm. Does a pretty good job, and it's it's clear to use on blueberries. Be very careful with Roundup uh, very, around any very. fruit. Roundup does strange things to <laughs> grapes and peaches and and things like that. So I just kind of I prefer not to use Roundup around my fruits. Now, why are you doing that? What about fertilizing? Of course, you know it already has fertilizer. Yeah, don't fertilize yeah. the first year. All right. Uh, Blueberries, you can do more damage over fertilizer uh -huh. than under fertilizer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So go very light. Uh, do not use ammonium nitrate. <laughs> it's better not to use nitrate forms of fertilizer. If you, when you add your nitrogen, probably need to use ammonium sulfate. That will lower the pH yes, because right. of the sulfur. Kind of a rule of thumb with planting uh, blueberries for me is to take off about a third of the growth I'm not going to worry about a third, but I am going to take off all the fruit and blooms because this first year I want all the energy to go to uh, growing a plant. This little blueberry has fruit, quite a bit of fruit on it, yes, as it you does. can see. Yes, it does. And it really handicaps the plant if you leave it on here. It will, it will make it uh, grow off a lot slower. All right, time to add a little sulfur. Okay. Uh, like I said, I think we need to drop it one whole point from a, from about 5.8 to 6 to 4.8 to 5. And that is uh, three tenths of a pound of elemental sulfur per uh, for 10 by 10 foot area. And so we're gonna fertilize about a 10 by 10 foot area. Uh, I got it, I've got it pre-weighed out here. Out. Okay. I just, just kinda, I want it to be as uniform and I, I'm going to stay uh, upwind. I'm sorry, camera folks. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's a few clumps here, and I'm going to step on the clumps and break them. It takes a pretty good while for this to change the pH, for okay. it to get completely mixed in the soil, but it is water soluble. So we ought to be okay. We've got our, we've done two of the most important things. We've applied sulfur to lower the pH, and we have the sphagnum peat moss in the planting hole. Right. So this blueberry is well on its way to being successful. All right, then, Mr. D, we appreciate that. Good deal. Can't wait to see what it looks like later. All right. All right. Good deal. Thank you. You notice this plant from the nursery has got some broken branches. And we can prune these out. And you'll notice this makes this one shorter. We take all these broken branches off, put up, cut them at about a quarter of an inch from a, from a the, the, the stem, and you notice this one here was, was, I cut about a quarter of an inch above a bud. These buds will break and fill out this area. If half of this plant was gone, I would get an, uh, pick another plant, but this one is okay because it's got a nice radiation of stems coming out, and we cut off the, the uh, broken branches, and there's still enough branch left to fill in the area that was broken off. All right, Mary, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? Ready. These are great questions. Great questions. All right, here's our first viewer email. Interesting. I have a Japanese maple, which I believe is an Acer Parmatum, China. One of the branches of my Japanese maple appears to have died during the winter. What should I do? It is on the south facing side of the tree. The tree is in filtered to full sun year round. Thanks, and this is Ricky from Corinth, Mississippi. So you have any suggestions for Ricky? Yeah, so give it some time. Give you know, we, time. we had a, Patience. yes, we had a couple late freezes this year. Um, so give it some time and see if any growth starts appearing on it. Um, and then we talked about the scratch test. Yeah, so I would, you know, peel back the bark if you can, scratch it, if you will. Uh, see if there's any green tissue there. If there's any green tissue, then you may be in luck. So mm -hmm. I, I would practice patience at that time. Yes. Right? No green tissue. Uh, I would still wait a little bit just to see if mm -hmm. it will form some buds on there. Uh, if it does not, then I would prune it off. Sure. I would do it at that point, uh, Mr. Ricky. But patience, patience, scratch test, and I think that'll help you out. Thank you for that question. All right? Here's our next viewer email. I need some help with my roses. It is now winter in Michigan, but come warm weather in summer, I get little green worms on my plants. Can I use neem oil to eliminate the green worms on my roses? This is thanks, Jan from Michigan. Ms. Jan, I know a little bit about those green worms, right? Because I grow roses at home, I have a lot of roses. And every year I always see the rose slug or the rose sawfly larva. That's what this is. They feed on the underside of the leaf. Okay. Most people are looking at the top. Mm -hmm. If you don't the underside, they can skeletonize your leaves, right? Yeah. So they eat in between the veins, okay? But the thing about this is, if those plants are healthy, they can withstand that damage, right? Now, if you must control them, we're gonna talk about low impact pesticides. You ask, could you use neem oil? You can use neem oil, mm -hmm. you can use horticulture oil, you can also use insecticidal soap but you have to target the larva stage. That's why the life cycle is so important. Read and follow the label, that'll do the trick. Yeah, I think so too. That will do it. So thank you for that question, Ms. Jan. Yeah, I know a lot about that. <laughs> All right, here's our next viewer email. Mary, this one is interesting this to a, me. It's okay. an interesting question. Are pet dogs and cats a threat to wildlife? And this is Sue from Covington, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. How do you want to address that? Well. I have dogs and cats, okay. so I'm, I'm a fan of them, okay. um, but I'm also a fan of wildlife. Okay. And they, I, I think dogs and cats can definitely have, be a threat to wildlife. Okay, so you do, okay. You do. The right. most important thing is, with cats, is keeping them indoors. Wow. It might make a couple people upset, um, but cats have a natural instinct to go after things that are moving. Wow. You know how a lot of people play with like feather dusters with their yes. cats. Yeah. It's imitating the movement of a bird. Okay. And so it's their natural instinct to go after birds and small mammals. A lot of times, if, especially if it's an indoor cat or a cat that comes in and out, they don't need that as food. So it's just entertainment for mm -hmm. 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife estimates that um, outdoor cats kill billions, with a B, with a B, billions of birds and small mammals every year. Every year. Yes. Wow. How about that. So a bell. Uh, some people say I have a bell on my cat, so it scares oh. the animals away. Cats are s smart <laughs> and sly, yeah. and they can move without you know making that bell make noise. I so. Like that. Keep your cats indoors is the best possible thing. Right. As far as dogs, you know, dogs on leashes when they're outside. Um, if you're not in an enclosed area or a, a dog park, um, don't let your dogs chase geese and other wildlife. Those animals you're uh, are spending energy getting away from your dog when mm. maybe they should be sitting on a nest or feeding or something like that. So. I don't think um, dogs and cats are a threat to wildlife if they're leashed and kept indoors. Leashed and kept indoors. Wow. Nine billion, though. I'm still on that Billions. with a B. How about that? Yeah. All right, Miss Sue. Yeah, so again, you know, Mary is cat, mm -hmm. dog. Sure. Right. Indoor cats Indoor and cats. Okay. leashed dog when, it, when it's outside. All right, but you love wildlife at the Absolutely. same time. Yeah. All right. That's good. So thank you, Mary. Thanks, Appreciate Chris. that. All right, thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about monarch butterflies or planting blueberries, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, ask us your gardening question. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. <music>